Hello, hello, can everyone hear me? All right. Welcome to our talk. The war never changes. Attack against, or attacks against WPA's new open standard, enhanced open, or, uh, yeah, open wireless encryption, or opportunistic wireless encryption. So this, yeah. is, um, this is Steve Derricott. He's the co-author, co-developer, co-parent of, of Sniff Glue. Um, Sniff Air, sorry. Uh, he's an amateur botanist, always wearing shades, and yeah. I, I wrecked your bio, man. <laughs> and this is Solstice. He made a crappy tool called EPAMMER. He wishes he could be a botanist, and everything he learns comes from Google. <laughs> All right, so on to the talk. So we're here to talk about uh, some of the new technology that's coming out with open, uh, open technology on Wi-Fi networks. What we're currently familiar with uh, is the standard that was released you know, in 1999, literally 20 years ago, was when this technology came out. And uh, obviously mass adopted by people um, because it was the new hotness. But then, you know, this, is, uh, this stayed around. This stayed around for a while. We can go to the next one. Um, we started off with web and open with those two initial standards, 802.11a and 802.11b. And uh, open obviously seems less secure because uh, WEP was wired equivalent privacy. So it was supposed to be encryption for the, the network um, because they knew that having an open network, anyone could passively receive those packets. So uh, out of those two technologies, you know, open is the only one that's still here today, not WEP. Um, and the reason for that, you can go ahead and go to the next one, Right? Why, why is that? Why is open still around even though it's 20 years old? Uh, WEP has been replaced. WPA2 is soon to be replaced with WPA3. Um, it's the battle we see every day in this industry of security versus convenience. If something is more convenient, people are going to be more willing to use it. If it's, they don't care if it's secure, they just want to get to Google and their, their Facebook and, and their Gmail, right? So, the fix actions, right? Um, who here uses Zoom for conferences? Uh, yeah, the web conferencing software Zoom. Remember, there was a big issue with that. And, uh, you know, if you use it on a MacBook and they weren't going to patch it, so Apple just took the nuclear option and patched it themselves, right? They released a patch for that <laughs> over Zoom and just said, forget that. This is similar to what we saw on the internet with open encryption or <laughs> with open networks ubiquitous everywhere and people constantly using them. Websites were aware of the vulnerabilities, so major vendors or major people, Google, Facebook, etc., started implementing HTTPS only to force people to use HTTPS. <laughs> right. So then we had that mass adoption of HTTPS everywhere, and that's similar to what we're seeing with Open Wireless or the OWE and the new Enhanced Open. Is that it's in still going to be um, like going to Google, right? There's no authentication. You don't have to log into Google to establish that initial HTTPS connection. It's just an encrypted handshake happens, boom, the certificates are validated, you're there. Um, this is going to be the same thing but for open networks. So there will be a, an exchange between the access point and the client, and that will encrypt the traffic between the two. So... Still, no authentication needed to connect to an access point, but you will have an encrypted session. Just like when you go to Google, no one can technically sniff your, your packets because they're encrypted with HTTPS, but yeah. Next. Um, right, so because of this, this led to downgrade attacks where, um, well, yeah, the, this is what forced Google and Facebook and all of them to enforce HTTPS only was the downgrade attacks that took place. So um, many people here in the wireless CTF, or if you've ever messed around with wireless technology, you know you can stand up evil twins, get people to connect to you, and then you're the network administrator at that point. So you can do whatever an evil network admin would do, like downgrade connections to you know redirect websites to HTTP versions. And that is why Google and other websites started forcing people to use HTTPS. But yeah, I'll hand it over to Gabe now.
Yeah. So, I mean, just to kind of like, you know, build off of what uh, Derekot was saying, um, imagine if, you know, every time that you went to uh, go to like an encrypted website on, on the internet and you had to type in a password. Uh, can you guys actually hear me? Okay. Can you hear me better? Okay. I, I guess I have to tilt this. Is it, is it shaky? If I do this, does this work better? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll give you that one back. Okay. So this mic is a little better. Um, yeah. So just rewind a little bit. Um, so, I mean, we, we, we mentioned that, you know, uh, 802.11 came out, you know, circa like 1999, right? And, you know, not long after that, you know, people realized, oh, you can sniff passwords from open networks. And, you know, by 2002, we actually had the earliest documented use of, of rogue AP attacks, evil twin attacks specifically, to intercept traffic, um, which, was, which was like these middle attacks that, that Steve was talking about. Um, you know, these attacks in, in combination with, with other techniques that started to emerge around that time period in the early 2000s, uh, you know, such as ARP cache poisoning, et cetera, uh, this, this led to the widespread adoption of HTTPS. Uh, you know, you know, a lot of, a lot of major, uh, like, I guess, like, internet-ish companies started, you know, actually just, real, you know, rigorously, like, rolling this out. Um, and, and this effectively ended the, pe the, the, the passive, you know, golden age of passive sniffing. You know, nowadays, it's, it's really difficult uh, just to sniff stuff offline and, and get anywhere with that. Um, it, it did put a dent in, in the effectiveness of evil twin attacks for a while, uh, but it did resurface as a threat model in 2009 due to the discovery of the, the downgrade attack, as we mentioned, uh, by Moxie Marlin Spike. Um, you know, so essentially by doing this, uh, you essentially kind of act as, as, as a malicious proxy of, of sorts and you, and you are able to downgrade uh, encrypted HTTP connections, so HTTPS connections to HTTP. Um, this was mitigated later on, so at this point you saw a resurgence of, of rogue AP attacks. This was uh, mitigated later on by the, the, the introduction of HSTS and cert pinning. Uh, so essentially, on paper, uh, you know, this would have happened around 2012, although realistically, you know, widespread adoption of HSTS didn't take off until much later, uh, just because it's, it's hard to roll out and it, it took some time to set up. Um, and, you know, for, it was like that transition phase, kind of like what we're seeing now with WPA3. So, you know, what is HSTS? Well, essentially the way HSTS works is that the client, you know, when, when your web browser is going to request a resource from an HSTS-enabled web server, uh, this server is going to add a special header called an HSTS header to the response. And, you know, and this is actually down here kind of what this looks like. That this header is going to tell the browser that it should always request content from the domain over HTTPS rather than HTTP. So, you know, if you attempt to use a downgrade attack, which at its core you're just, there, there's some redirection involved where you, where you redirect the, the victim's browser to the HTTP version of the site, uh, the browser will actually refuse because it's been, you know, this domain has been added to a, a, a preload list essentially or not really, it's an HSTS list um, that says this domain can only be loaded over HTTPS. So you'll get a, a basically an internal, um, I believe it's a 309 redirect that the browser will issue to the HSTS version of the site um, and you won't be, and, and essentially the HTTP downgrade attack won't work. Um, so there, there were some, some bypasses that came out for HSTS in 2014. Uh, one of the most notable ones is by Jose Selvi. Um, so Essentially, HSTS headers, they have a max age parameter uh, that dictates when the web browser should stop treating the header's origin domain as an HSTS site. Because, you know, imagine if you accidentally set something to a as an HSTS site and you could never, ever undo it. Um, so, you know, essentially what, what uh, Selby figured out is that unless un unauthenticated NTP packets are cryptographically signed, it's possible to tamper with them and you can essentially shift the victim's system clock forward past the max age set in the HSTS uh, header. And by doing that, um, you know, essentially, you, you can you can expire the HSTS um, entries in, in in their list, and you know HSTS is effectively bypassed at this point. But there's you know since his uh, bypass technique came out, there you know there are a lot of actual other ways that operating systems deal with um, uh, kind of kind of deal deal with the threat. So for example, Windows, they ha you know it has um, their directives that, that basically say uh, you cannot shift the time forward past, you know, further than a certain, you know, delta of time because, you know, it, it would allow you to do this. Um, reason why I mentioned this though, you know, if we look at the current wireless security threat model um, and, and just kind of examine how today's attackers use wireless attacks, um, you know, they're primarily used for gaining initial network access to weakly configured WPA and WPA2 networks. You know, either evil twin attacks against EAP or, or you're, you know, finding ways to get PSKs from WPA PSK networks and crack them. Um, or they're used for stealing Active Directory credentials using GTC downgrade attacks or hostile portal attacks. Um, or you see people using them, you know, for social engineering attacks using captive portals. You don't really see, um, you know, 
if you do see attacks against open networks, you know, they're really most effective uh, because of this widespread use of HTTPS and also the widespread use of, of HSTS on the stuff that really matters and would be attractive to, to an attacker. Um, you know, really, if, you're, if, you, if you want the most bang for your buck if you're attacking an open network, um, you're going to be doing, you're essentially going to be looking for static content or mixed content issues that will allow you to, you know, inject payloads and, in, you know, into, that will eventually get loaded into the, the user's browser. So, for example, you know, you start intercepting traffic, set up your, your, um, your interception attack, and, uh, you know, you're intercepting traffic and you notice that they're, you know, loading, you know, third-party JavaScript code over HTTP. Well, you can replace that with your own JavaScript code, you know, that basically downloads a beef hook and then you own their browser and eventually their, their system. But, you know, really you don't see a, a lot of credential stealing attacks, um, you know, because most high-value targets are using HSTS and cert pinning and defeating HSTS is difficult at best. Um, HSTS is difficult at best. And defeating cert pinning without social engineering is virtually impossible. Um, and really doesn't make sense in light of other attack paths, you know, just if you're going to go to that length, you might as well just use spear phishing or something. Um, as for passive sniffing, it, it honestly rarely works anymore unless you're I mean, occasionally you'll see like someone's logging to something over POP3 or something like that, but it, it, it's, it's very rare. Um, and this is, this is kind of the, way, the reason why we bring up this background information. If we kind of go to, um, you know, look at OWE, right? Do um, you want to go for this part or do you want me to go? Okay. <laughs> so, so OWE, right, it, it, it kind of was introduced fairly recently um, and it's, it's being rolled out kind of as we speak it, to kind of solve this problem of not being able to have unauthenticated Wi Fi access. Um, you know, without, you know, so essentially it, it, it's designed to give you encryption capabilities, uh, you know, and, and act as if you were connected to an open network, uh, but you don't need to authenticate. So, you know, how you connect to a HTTPS site over, um, you know, you know, and, and you don't have to enter a password. OWE is supposed to work the same way with uh, open networks. Um, you know, the way it works is, you know, you start out with your typical association. Um, and when this happens, the client AP are going to complete a Diffie Hellman key exchange and create a pairwise master key or PMK. Um, after that, the AP is going to initiate a four-way handshake, kind of similar to what WPA does, uh, but using that PMK, and you're going to generate a key encryption key or KEK and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, but at, 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 at that point, you do this four-way handshake, and you end up with some encryption keys that are used to protect both unicast and broadcast data. Um, but basically, it's an open network with crypto. Um, so as far as the actual discovery process, um, so, I mean, the way this works, right, and I'll, I'll, I'll load this up in Wireshark so you can get a better idea of what this is doing, but, you know, the way, the way that OW works is the access point is going to advertise its, its support for this protocol using um, an AKM suite selector. I mean, it's basically an RSN element that's added to all beacon frames that are getting sent out from the AP. Uh, the client's going to discover these OWA, it's going to discover the, that the, the AP is OWA compliant uh, because it's going to look in the beacon frames and see this RSN, and then it's going to, you know, kick off the authentication process with it. So to show you what I'm talking about, because it's a little more clear if, I do it this way. While he's pulling that up, um, Gabe just talked about a lot of attacks that you can do against open networks um, from injecting your own code and uh, all of these things. And passive sniffing is not something that we commonly use on our wireless pen test. It rarely generates anything worth benefiting from. So OWE is fixing a problem that we, we weren't even concerned about. I didn't. I rarely am sniffing passive data to begin with because everything is typically encrypted by major vendors such as Google and Facebook. So I, there's no reason for me to passively sniff open networks anyways. All right, so I'm gonna, right now I've just, I've just launched an OWE access point. I'm using virtual um, uh, wireless interfaces here. And I'm just gonna filter here for beacon frames. I hope you can actually see this. Um, all right, so cool, I have a bunch of beacon frames here. And the SSID is open Wi-Fi, but it's not actually open Wi-Fi. This is a, if you look here, right, you can scroll all the way down to the bottom. Actually, I'm going to minimize some of these tags here because they're, they're probably, yes. I, I don't know why, um, you know, Wireshark by default, it just opens everything that you want to look at. Like, it's not helpful, but, uh, RSN, okay, so, tag, RSN information. Can everyone see this? Can anyone not see this in the back? It's probably really small. Um, but, you know, feel free to ask us later if you want us to walk through this in person because I have a feeling it might be hard to see on the screen. But, okay, so there's a tag here, RSN information, and you can see here that, um, you know, this is coming from the AP, it's a beacon frame. And we have this um, off-key management, AKM, and it'll actually tell you that it's using um, 
uh, opportunistic wireless, wireless encryption, and it'll also have the RSync capabilities. So essentially, everything you need to know about how this thing uses crypto, basically. Um, let me go back to these slides. So, um, so an interesting thing, um, if, in case you're not aware, so a um, little background information. Uh, so elements are actually, what, what you're seeing here in the, in the Wireshark thing, right, these are what are known as elements, um, or information elements. Uh, and they're sent between the client and the AP as requests and responses. And they're used to fa facilitate protocol agnostic communication uh, between wireless devices. Um, they're basically, elements are basically a form of time length, or a type length value. Uh, which, which means that they're, it's a, data, the type, a TLV is a data type that's comprised of three parts. It's going to have an element ID, which is identifying the element's data type. Um, it's going to have a length, which is the element's length, and a value, which is basically, you know, this field is entirely dependent on the element's data type, which is, um, so essentially what this lets you do is you can send something from the client to the AP or the, or the AP to the client, and the client doesn't have to really know what data type it's receiving. Um, I, I, I talked to a guy who's into reverse engineering later and this terrified him but, uh, er, earlier, but, but essentially it'll first check at the, it, basically the TLV, the element, is just a, a string of bytes and, you know, your, your wireless device is going to look at the first, uh, you know, the first bytes in it and it's going to use that to determine the data type. Then it's going to grab the length from the next set of, set of bytes and then from there it's just going to know how, basically how large um, the next field of bits is, or bytes. Um, so, the reason why I mention this is that in 802.11, association requests and responses are constructed entirely by appending elements to one another. So you just get a bunch of these TLVs and start appending them off, off, off each other. And in OWE, um, there's a Diffie-Hellman parameter element that's appended to both association requests and responses. And this is how the AP and the client uh, give each other their public keys. Uh, so, you know, essentially, uh, once you reach the association process, uh, the client's going to send an association request to the AP, and it's going to have an element in, you know, kind of in the packet there that, that is, is going to contain its public key. The AP is then going to give, you know, respond with the association response, and there's going to be an element, a Diffie-Hellman parameter element, that's going to have the AP's public key. And at this point, they've exchanged keys, and they proceed to the, the four-way handshake we talked about. Um, so just to uh, kind of show you how that works. So we have this, this OWE access point running right now. And... I'm going to get this thing to authenticate, right? So on the left, we're just using WPA supplicant. We're going to connect to this AP, and I'm going to go back to Wireshark. And at this point, I'm just going to start sniffing packets again. Actually, I might have to do this a second time because uh, I missed it. Kill that, and then I'm going to start. That's going to associate. And I'm going to change this to say that I don't want any beacon packets because there are a lot of them and they'll get in the way of what we're doing. Okay. So let me just figure out. Uh, did I lose this thing here? Hey, man, do you know how to, like, What's up? get this thing to come back down? No. Uh, oh, I got it. Never mind. Okay, cool. So... Here we have, um, I'm going to try to find that. But, okay, so here we have the probe request, probe response. We briefly talked about that. I'm going to scroll down until we see. Okay, here's the association request that we talked about that's coming from the AP, or I'm sorry, from the client device. And if you look in here, we have this uh, extended tag, uh, which is this element we were talking about, and it contains the public key from the client device that's being sent to the AP. And then you, get a, you have an acknowledgement from the, from the access point, and then below that, you have an association response that is, you know, literally the same thing. Here we have these OWE Diffie-Hellman parameters, and then that's going to get sent back to the, the, the client device there. So then the key exchange happens, and we have this little four-way handshake here, and then you have basically encrypted open Wi-Fi, which is what happens after that. Right, and all this would happen invisibly to you. you, you if you just opened up your phone, looking at Wi-Fi networks, you would see an open network, you would connect to it, if your phone is capable of OWE, it would read that packet that, um, or the those OWE packets that Gabe was just pointing out, and then it would go through that process. If not, it would just connect to an open network normally. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so I guess the problem with OWE, right? I mean, it, it does some good things, right? It addresses the need to provide encryption for unauthenticated wireless connections. Um, you know, and also makes use of protected management frames uh, and, and makes them mandatory. We're going to go more into that a bit later. Um, 
Unfortunately, the, the, the thing that it does not do is it does not provide a means of verifying the identity of the access point. We're not the first ones to point this out. Uh, you know, I mean, people have been kind of bringing this up. Even, even the authors are like, you know, in, in the RFC itself, there's actually a big disclaimer that's saying it does not do this. But, you know, just want to do a little thought experiment here. Uh, thought experiment here. Imagine if HTTPS did not provide a means of verifying the identity of, of the web server. So, in other words, whenever you use, you know, HTTPS, everyone used self-signed certs and no warnings were ever issued for anything whatsoever. It, it would kind of negate, you know, the effectiveness of HTTPS, right? And that's kind of what OWE is like, you know. <laughs> Good thing. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> um, so, do you, you want to grab this part? What? No. Oh, yeah. So, OWE doesn't address any real threat or attack in the that you see in the wild today. It's only encrypting, you know, the traffic. Which, if I'm standing up my access point and you're connected to me, I'm a network admin at that point. I'm going to see your traffic regardless because I'm going to route it wherever I want. Um, it doesn't matter if it's encrypted between your phone and my access point. Once it gets to my access point, I'm in control of the packets. Yeah. So I mean, it really only succeeds in preventing malicious users from doing passive sniffing, um, which, as we mentioned, is kind of a fruitless exercise in the first place. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So when we kind of embarked on, I mean, we kind of, a few months ago, we were like, hey, we should look into ways to attack OWE. And we thought it would be much more complicated than it actually was. Um, and it turned out it's actually not really that hard. Uh, it, you know. It, <laughs> Right. So, I mean, the first thing you, I mean, if, if, if you do want to, I mean, the first technique that we, I guess, I don't even want to say we came up with this because it's like literally the same attack that people have been using for 20 years. Um, but the first technique is just to stand up an OWE evil twin, right? You, you make an evil twin access point, um, you know, using your favorite rogue AP tool like Sniff Glue or... Uh, <laughs> eat, eat blammer. <laughs> and, then, and then you, you know, do what you're going to do. So... Which, I mean, we kind of demonstrated that works here. I mean, like, just to keep this simple, I'm just going to tell WPA supplicant to start probing for stuff. And this is pretty much exactly what would happen if, like, you were just wandering around somewhere and had your Wi-Fi on and someone stood up, a note, like, they essentially knew the network on your PNL and stood up their own access point, right? As expected, it, it, would, it would connect. Um, yeah, I mean, that's... It's 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 fairly straightforward, at the, right? That's um, a standard evil twin attack. Right, nothing right. new there. It's nothing. It, it's, it just it's, has open in, or OWE. It's really nothing yeah. novel, but that's the problem. Um, I just yeah. But this is the more surprising part. Um, as it turns out, and we kind of just discovered this by accident, but and this is probably like a honestly an implementation issue, but you know, it, for WPA supplicant, for example, which is what you'll find on most Android phones. You know, uh, well, check this out. Okay, so instead of instead of using an open an OWE access point, or I'm going to create an open access point. So here I'm, I'm going to show you the config file we just we just uh, used to connect to that OWE access point, right? And you can see, right, it's using key management OWE. This is this is an o OWE config file we're passing to w WPA supplicant. And then for for EPAMR or whatever the tool you're using. Trying to remain agnostic here, but um, you know what happens if we if we spin up an open access point instead? I mean, this this shouldn't work. But, like these two things should not be able to communicate with one another. I mean, unless it's in transition mode, which it's not. Um, so here we go. We've started. And oh, what's this at the bottom of the screen? Okay, so we've now have this thing that is configured to use OWE, but is connecting to this open access point, which. At least in this case with WPA supplicant, it looks like you can execute rogue AP attacks against stuff that is expecting an OWE network using open Wi-Fi. So you don't even need the new, you know, retooled versions of all these rogue AP tools to do this. You can just use the same tools that you've been using for the past two decades as an open network. And in this case, it, it works. <laughs> so... Yeah, that's kind of what we thought about this too. Um, you want to talk about compatibility? Uh, I guess. All right. Let's uh, what's it? 
through the Slack yeah. the thing. <laughs> Okay, so compatibility mode or fast transition mode, I believe it's also called. Um, what happens is within the beacon frames of an open network, uh, it will have within an information element the a hidden SSID. So it'll be a BSSID, a MAC address associated to a hidden network that is doing OWE. So invisibly to you, your device would connect to that network or receive that frame and notice, oh, hey, I need, if I'm OWE capable, I'm going to look at this hidden uh, network and connect to that instead. So, um, yeah, that, it's, when you're broadcasting frames like that, anyone can read that as well. So we got the idea of, well, why can't we just look at that packet and then spin up our own evil twin using that same BSS ID that's in that same packet. And, uh, yeah, to kind of illustrate how this works, you know, actually, so I'm going to spin up a, um, I'm going to, I'm going to wait for this event loop to stop because computers. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up this OWE transition mode AP, right? And what's going to happen, oh, okay. Did I spell something wrong? Give me a second. Oh, open track. Okay, yeah. So that was typo on my part. So right here, I'm I'm creating a. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't have happened if I was using Snippair. <laughs> so um, essentially, we're gonna we're gonna launch this thing. We just created an OWE transition mode AP, which is kind of interesting because it's actually two APs. It's two BSSs being served off a single piece of hardware. Um, so if we go back to Wireshark really fast, uh, and this time we actually do want to look at beacon frames again, so I'm going to just kind of replace that. Um, you'll, you'll see two, uh, two SSIDs here. Uh, the first one is a wildcard, so this is a hidden SSID that we're seeing. We don't really know what this is. And then we see this, this open, this open uh, SSID. So essentially what happens is, you know, the idea of the transition mode is that you're supposed to have a, a setup where, you know, no matter whether the device only supports open, authentic, you know, open, it, if it, whether it supports OW or not, it can still connect to this network. Um, so what will happen is that the publicly visible SSID, right, it's, it's, it belongs to an open BSS, so an open, open network. Um, and, and we see that here with this SSID uh, that, that's visible. Um, and if, an op if, if a device that only supports connecting to open networks, doesn't support OWE, attempts to connect to this thing, that'll be it. It'll, it'll, it'll just use the open network. However, um, an OWE-capable OWE device, when it tries to connect, essentially it will, it'll look through these fields and grab the SSID of the, um, of the hidden network that we see here, right? In this case, it says, you know, that SSID is open Wi-Fi. Um, but it's usually just a random string of characters. It will, it will grab that SSID and then reconnect. It'll send a pro request for that SSID and then reconnect to the wildcard one that we see here, right? So just to kind of demonstrate that. I'm actually going to have to edit this really fast. I guess the, the default here is it for, for it to use spelled backwards, so. There we go, okay. So here we have a device that's gonna attempt to connect using open explicitly, right? And I can't type today. <laughs> And you'll see here that it's connected to the public SSID, the, the one that, that's visible, right? Um, uh, Remapay or whatever this is, right? And, you know, all is expected. If we instead elect to use the, um, the config file that, that makes it look for an open, an open um, or sorry, the OWE access point, it will first connect to 
the open Wi-Fi, which you should see in a second. Come on, demo gods. Oh, that's a little weird. Okay, hang on a minute. <laughs> Should be right. Oh, live demos, gotta love them. Yep. <laughs> supposed to be the open config. Yeah, one? I I don't know. Well, good thing we have. All right, I'm going to try a different config really fast. Okay, all right, I see what I did. I tried to specify the random SSID instead of the open one. Okay, cool. So this should work. So, um, yeah, so you see here it says try and authenticate with, uh, so despite the fact that we configured it to go for the visible um, network, right, uh, which, was, which was this, it instead shifts over and tries to go for this randomly visible one. So going back to Wireshark really fast, um, just to kind of uh, show you what we're doing. We replace this with the, the public, the public um, SSID is now open Wi-Fi. And the random one, the random hidden uh, OWE uh, ESSID is this, this random st string of characters there. It's not really random, I just mashed keyboards, the, the keyboard a bit to get it. But um, So it's connected to the random one. So that's how that works. Okay. And just did that. Uh, I think we just talked about this basically. Yeah. I don't know if you want to review it or. Yeah, so this is just basically what we talked about. But um, if your client doesn't do o OWE, then it's just going to connect to the open network. But uh, if it does support OWE, then it's going to look for that hidden network and then associate to that one instead. So we tried a number of techniques to attack this kind of network. The first was just creating an OWE evil twin. You know, just we figured just grab the RSN or the grab the SSD from that that information element. Uh, it turns out this doesn't actually work uh, because the the uh, client device, and actually that's, that's why the first demo failed is because we essentially tried to do that. Um, you know, but if you just, if you just try to, you know, create a, an OWE evil twin using that, that random ESID, it's, it's going to fail. However, um, what does work is that you just do an o OWE transition evil twin. So you, you, you match it exactly. You know, you match both the, uh, the public ESID and and the the private one. And the um, the third te technique that we figured out is you just use an open evil twin, and surprisingly that works as well. Because remember what we and and, and once again that that's likely uh, just a um, implementation issue or something because it, it it really isn't defined that way in the RFCs. But oops, I locked myself out. Um, For example, if we just create an open network here, even if this device is expecting OWE, for some reason, it'll still connect to your open access point. Or at least it'll try to. There's some weirdness going on there. But, oh, there we go. Yeah, off failure. Well, anyways, it worked earlier. <laughs> so, the one thing that I think actually OWE gets right is the use of PMF. I mean, oh. <laughs>
Yeah. Uh, with uh, management frame protection, you're um, getting rid of deauths. So that's one of the most common attacks that we see today is knocking people off a network and then recording the transaction of when they connect right back to that access point. And that's one of the, the major features of WPA3 is that it's going to enforce all of that, uh, the protected management frames so that deauths is going to be no longer a thing to worry about. All these guys walking around at cons with their deauthors, you know, it won't matter anymore at that point. And, and this also relates to the rogue IP attacks, the issues we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, it's not always possible to um, get something to connect to you, uh, to get, get a device to connect to your rogue IP, uh, simply by providing a superior signal. That's often actually harder uh, than it looks. Um, and, and when that happens, you know, pretty much the go-to technique that, that people rely on is, is you know, de-authenting the target access point, uh, you know, to, to kind of force the, the, the connected client devices to roam somewhere else. Um, and, you know, I, th I think what it does get right is it, it, it does prevent you from doing that. Uh, because, you know, with management frame encryption, basically, you, you, have a, you encrypt all the management frames that are going between the client and the AP, so you can't just, like, inject the authentication packets and get it to work that way. Um, but, you know, the problem is that you could still just kind of go back and, um, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you're targeting a, a client that's, like, by itself, it's not connected to an AP, then this doesn't even bear any relevance uh, because, um, yeah, you, you wouldn't have to de -auth at that point. Um, but just to kind of show you what I mean by that. So, you know, say I, c I create this, this OWE access point, right? And then I connect this, this supplicant to it. Well, provided this can actually authenticate, because it, it was having some weirdness earlier. But, well then. Okay, so likely this is a driver issue. Um, I'm using virtual Wi-Fi drivers. So what I'm going to do, so I'm just going to reload them really fast. Do RM mod Mac 802.11. That's why you don't do live demos, folks. But we decided to be... Uh, a little bold about it. I'm gonna set radios to five. All right, this should work now. All right, yeah, so that worked. It was a driver issue. Um, let me just take a look at my MAC addresses really fast. Okay, cool. So, just to show you what we kind of mean by this, we do air replay. Do you know if it's like the dash A or dash B? I can't oh. remember. Air replay. Oh, which one? Uh, just to specify the AP. Yeah, it's A. It's A. A. Okay. C is a client. I Google. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I'm I'm just going to specify the ESSID of the um of the access point, which is just zero zero one one two two. Three three four four. I believe it was five five, if I remember correctly. No, it was, it was zero zero. And we're going to specify the uh, the MAC address of the client device, which in this case was what was it? It was this thing right here. Okay, cool. Oh, we got to give it an interface. Yeah, let me do that really fast. And two. So I'm just going to put my, my third Wi Fi interface into monitor mode really fast and bring it back up. And all right, so we're literally just spamming this thing with the authentication packets right now. And you know, nothing's happening. Um, so you can see that those deauth attacks don't work anymore. Um, one interesting thing to, to think about, though, is, is this. You know, if we're pushing out protocols in which, um, you know, protected man management frames are, are required, right, then that's in inevitably going to lead to more devices uh, supporting the use of protected management frames. Right now, it's not that widely used because there's, you know, not a consistent support across, you know, hardware uh, for this kind of thing. Um, 
But something to think about, right? You know, the way a lot of like IDS systems or wireless intrusion protection systems work, um, you know, to contain these kinds of attacks that we're showing you, uh, essentially, if they see a rogue AP and they see one of their own devices connecting to it, they'll start deauthing it. Well, now you're going to have a situation where you're going to have widespread use of, uh, of or support for PMF, and on top of that, you know, if you're an attacker, you can make use of that as well. So if you actually successfully execute an attack and get one of these devices to connect to you, um, and you're using PMF yourself, uh, regardless of whether you're not you're using OWE, then you've kind of made yourself immune from you know, what is essentially the standard containment method used by WIPS uh, devices today. So that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out um, in terms of how people design those things. Um, any questions? If you have any questions, we're team What the Freak over in the wireless CTF. If you want to come hang out, ask us stuff over there, we'll be over there. Thanks.